What did we just find with double integration? Acceleration. Absolutely oh, not. So, <laughs> Volume. Volume. So what we're going to do now is the same process, but we're going to find area. And I was so confident when I said that too. Yeah, that's why it was funny. <laughs> so I did it on purpose. Well, no, I really thought. All right, let's move on. <laughs> So we're going to get the area of a region. So before we used regions to integrate over, there was some height over top of it, and we were integrating the over the region to find the volume with the height. <coughs> Let's think about the double integral over r. But instead of putting any old function in, I'm going to choose the function 1. And then we're going to have a dA. So what we're going to do is we're really finding a volume uh, over some region, some blobby region, but it's going to have a height of 1. So whenever one of your dimensions is a unit, basically if you kind of ignore that dimension, you are looking at the measurement on the other dimensions. Is the R the region of the two integrals? It's the region, it's a subset of R2? No, 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 all the integrals that you have written there? That one, yeah, is that the region of the, the double in integrals? So it's the same, it's the same R, it's the same region. So before it was, it's, it can be a type 1 or a type 2, are the two types of regions we can integrate now. We can also do rectangles, but we can also do type 1 and type 2. Uh, so all we're going to do is just put a height 1 uh, function over top, and then we're going to measure the volume. That'll be the same as the area, which is a little bit strange. Uh, if you want a lower dimensional analog, so back in the good old days, we let's see if you had a height 1. So this about represent height 1 right there. If you have a rectangle, that was 1 by w. Our area would equal 1 times w, which is w. That's also the same as the width of the rectangle. So <coughs> it's a little bit misleading to say the width is the area, but numerically that's true when your height is 1. So that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm not saying that like a cubic centimeters cubed or inches cubed is the same as inches squared, but the number will be the same. So I'm going to do a lot of saying the volume is the area, but what I mean is it has the same numerical value. So area equals width. Okay, so all we have to do our f is the same thing we did before, except our function is super easy to take the antiderivative of. So what's antiderivative of 1? If you're doing a dx, antiderivative is x. If you do a dy, it's y. So the antiderivative part is super easy. We're just going to focus basically on the region this time. So our regions are going to get a little more complicated in this section. So our region is going to be bounded by y equals x plus 3y. And that also equals x squared. So you have y equals x plus 3y, but that also equals x squared? Yes. I think that should be a 2. All right, so this is kind of like a double inequality. There's really two equalities going on. So there's a left equality and a right equality. Uh, there's two ways to write this out. Probably the easiest. 2 would be pairing it up like this right here. Uh, because y also equals the uh, x plus 2y, I could write 
x plus 2y like this. I'm only going to go with the easier version because I want to keep things easy. my notes are messed up. Well, let's try to graph this out and then see what we get. And if it doesn't make a nice region, we'll come back and change it. I had some scribble out on my notes and I think I've interpreted it correctly. All right, one of these is easy to graph, so focus on the other one. Parabola is super easy to graph. How do you graph this other equation? So combine like terms. So sort it out and make it a little nicer. I think it's a line. Graph looks kind of ugly, but gets the point across. We should have one region that's finite. Just like in uh, calculus two, there's lots of other regions that this creates. This creates an infinite region at the top, an infinite region on the right, an infinite region over here, but there's only one finite region. Well, and this weird one up here. But the one region we want, there should be not ambiguous. There should be pretty clear what region we're talking about here. Could this be a type 1 or a type 2, or could it go either way? It could go either way. It looks like it can go either way. So I'll let you choose how you want to break it down. You do have to find the two intersection points, and I'm going to leave that up to you. So I'm going to give you a two minute head start, see what you can do. You choose which type you want. They both should work out to be, uh, they should both work out to be the same thing. And I don't want to scroll up, but you can scroll up. You can get the volume uh, formula. You're just integrating one over the region.
You'll do triples soon. Probably. Next section. Very nice. I have to choose my balance. Well, for this one, doing a look at the little something. Very, I mean, finding your balance for the other two variables, that'd be interesting. But it so also means you've got four variables. So you'll have an X, Y, Z, and maybe a W or something like that. Right. Some other letter. Good stuff. That'd be negative one minus zero. That'd be negative one, I think. Yeah. I think it'd be negative one. Big minus small. Oh, it might be positive. Yeah. 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 So remember, big is, if you're going left, right, big right. is on the right, small is on the left. Right. I think that messed me up one of the last couple classes. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but it comes from the, I need to solve it, 4x. So we're going to get square root y, but what's still wrong with this? Plus or minus. So there was a plus or minus. I actually want the negative one this time. So I want to go negative square root y. So my x's are negative. If I went with the regular square root y, I would be on the right half of the parabola, not the left half. Then the other one should be easy, I think. We got y equals negative x, or x equals negative y. And if you're wondering, these are basically both x equals x equals. You're describing x values as functions of y. If, if you flip back, maybe I'll just flip back for a second here. You can see exactly what's happening right here. So I have a left function and a right function of y. They're both describing x values. That's why they're both x equals function of y, x equals other function of y. So this is what I was looking at when I was trying to determine type 2. They're always describing the same value, so if you were doing the, the y... Well, it's a left and a right is what they're describing. It's a left bound and right bound. But if you were doing type 1 and you were doing the y... Then I would be looking at this and finding a top and a bottom function. Okay, but they will both be y equals. Yes. Okay. So that's why this is the mo For me, this is what's useful for type 1, exactly what's on the board. And what's useful for me for type 2 is this right here. So that's what I recommend you keep for yourself to help you out. And if you need to, it should be pretty clear what's the big and small, but in my opinion, this is a little bit less useful than the picture I was looking at a second ago. It should be pretty clear what's going on from this picture if you've done enough problems. You're just integrating the function over the region. Um, and because I described the way the order goes, it should be pretty clear which, what's, you know, in this case, x is first, y is second. And that just really comes from practice. So real quick, since you're doing that type, uh, aren't you going to put the intersection points in the chip, or like back on the property right now? Yep. Uh, aren't you going to have to find where the y's cross on the x, like the y? Well, so when I wrote my intersection points, I wasn't sure what type I was going. So I wrote them x, y, x, y. So I could, from this, I could go either way. So I basically had the information for type 1 or type 2. So I recommend when you find intersection points, it's probably convenient to just find both values and then go whichever uh, type you want. All right, so we got left and right. We're almost ready to, I think we are ready to write this down. We're going to integrate 1. <coughs> Now these are both x equals the which one is the little square root or the regular so our square root is the let's see little one and now I need y values for my outside and these are just numbers here and that should be 0 to 1 and from this is this dx first? Yeah. dx, dy. All right, so there's our volume. So this antiderivative is super easy. I'm going to show you a shortcut. It's not really that short. It just skips one step. So I know the antiderivative is x. That's super easy. The next thing I'm going to do is plug in the two endpoints. And it's going to be basically this endpoint minus this endpoint. So we're going to basically take a step over the actual uh, antiderivative. This is going to be big one, which is negative y minus negative square root y. So that's the antiderivative in one step. You can only do this if it's a super easy antiderivative, and you can plug it in immediately. So this one, antiderivative 1, is super easy. It's x, and I'm just subtracting my two endpoints. just finish this off. Negative y squared over 2 plus 2 thirds y to the 3 halves.
questions? Anybody else got one sixth? Yes. So I'm not going to go and do the other type, the other way to break it down, but you should be able to uh, switch to the other type. Probably not. I think the confusion from the notes came from the example that we put up here as uh, y equals x plus 2 and y equals x squared. So that's supposed to be like a common difference. Squared equals 2. So basically, I dropped an extra. W uh. This is supposed to be a common difference. That makes perfect sense. So we're going to do average value now. Uh, when we're averaging, we are generally going to take some quantity and divide it by some other quantity. And uh, what we're going to find now is the average volume or average height, average volume, average height of a function over a region. So we're going to take the actual volume and divide it by the area. So that's how we're going to get the average height. Average height of a function f x y over region R is. We're just going to take uh, the volume divided by the area of R. This is the volume of height f over R. Good news is we have formulas for both of these. So our volume is double integral over R f dA and our area double integral over R1 dA. So the formula is super easy. The other good thing about this, you don't have to compute which region you have more than once. It's the same region and the only difference is your second integral, your bottom integral is almost trivial. So you just have to line up your region once. So let's do a problem. So find the average value. Of f of x, y equals x cos x, y over, and I'll choose a very easy region. Zero pi cross zero one. So your region is a rectangle. It's probably not even worth thinking about what type of rectangle it is. You can do it without thinking about types. So draw your region out and figure out what your bounds are and then find the antiderivative. Your antiderivative may not be super easy in this problem. So guessing and checking could be a good move. And one order, I think, is easier than the other order. I think I'd rather take a y derivative, or y antiderivative. Right. Or maybe I won't take an x, I'm not sure. You'll find out. But yeah, if you can't take it one way, switch your order, take it the other way. So if you're staring at an x antiderivative, you don't know, Change the order around and then find the y antiderivative. So I just sketched the region for you. Not very impressive.
I wrote both versions down. Whenever you have a rectangle, it's trivial to change the order. You just literally change dx dy to dy dx and you change your endpoints. It's only when you don't have a rectangle you have to spend some time changing uh, your region around. So any questions on those two forms? I took two guesses, one of them was good, one of them was not good, so I am deciding to go that way. You can also do use some other skills I showed you, like use substitution. I think if you really want to integrate on the left, integration by parts is the way you have to go, which I'm not really feeling right now, so you can totally go integration by parts if you want to, it's up to you but I'm just going to go the easy route instead. So possible but really ugly. No problem. And then I got to integrate that a second time. <laughs> that should be easy. Alright, so hopefully I've taught you to be reasonable. No? Alright. So we're going to choose that one on the right. What did I do wrong? So my spidey sense kicked in because I see x's and y's mixed together and I'm on my last antiderivative. That should not be happening. So where did I mess up? I, yeah, I plugs, let's see, I should have been writing y values. And I think I wrote x instead. Alright, so that's a subtle mistake that I showed you how to recognize it. Usually you'll have mixed variables in your last integral if you've made that mistake. Unfortunately that's not always true, but frequently that'll be the result of making that mistake.
other calculus questions? Oh. All right. So I could set up, <coughs> this is the volume of the region. How can I get that area super fast? So we got a rectangle area. You should be experts at computing the area of a rectangle. Do it. Our volume was 2, our area should be pi, with pi, height 1. So we're going to take our average is uh, volume over area. So average height is volume over area, which is 2 over pi. So that is our average height. Yeah, so if this Yeah, if this wasn't a rectangle or a circle or or some shape you knew how to get the area of, yeah, I would just compute. Um, and we can write it down. I mean this one is super easy to write down. You can go either way. I think I did dy dx. What are we end up doing? Yeah, dy dx, so I'll set this guy up dy dx. So our x's went zero pi. This is one zero pi, y is one zero one. So that would be our, our setup here, for sure. So our next chapter, our next section is double integrals in polar form. Yeah, that's it. Not every section is super complicated. So something weird happened in polar form that you noticed before, or at least I noticed and pointed it out. Hopefully you noticed too. What happened was our, what used to be unit squares turned into unit pieces of pizza crust. And they got bigger and bigger areas as we moved away from the origin. So we have to worry about that here as well. So we'll start by drawing a piece of pizza. So here our angle is going to be delta theta. Our area will still use the AK for the area of the K piece. The amount of radius that is changing will use delta R for that. I need to get a area. So to find a k, we need a couple things. I can't just measure. I'm going to do this. So the way we're going to estimate the area here, we're going to use circumference. I'll use a green for the circumference. We can choose either of these two. So I'm going to use circumference. And then the other measurement I'm going to use is delta R. There we go, circumference times delta R. So we're going to treat it like it's a rectangle. So we're going to treat it like it's a rectangle even though it's not actually a rectangle. So the way to think about this as a rectangle, you're kind of going in, take your pizza crust and kind of straighten it out. Now if your pizza crust is super thin, 
that's not a problem. And remember, what we're going to end up doing is cutting these infinitely thin in both directions. So what it's actually going to look like, there's going to be a ton of slices this direction and a ton of them going that way. So we're going to end up with tiny, tiny pieces. So it's okay to deform them a little bit. That's a very good question. For example, things would be screwed up if I took the straight line distance instead of the curve. That would give us uh, an incorrect area estimate. But yeah, but you're supposed to be subdividing, so you can make assumptions like uh, delta theta is never bigger than one degree or something. You can make because the limit's going to zero, you can say it's never bigger than this tiny value. So let's write out what these actually are. Uh, what do I need to figure out the circumference? I need a little more than just how wide the angular opening is. That's only part of the circumference. What else do I need to know for the actual circumference? I need a measurement from the origin. So not only do I need to know the angle that it's open, I need to know how far out we're going. So that will be R right there. So that's whatever R coordinate you're at at the moment. That's how far away from the origin you are. We're going to assume our R's are always positive. So that will let us get circumference. Now I'm going to write the circumference formula down. It's our angle, which is delta theta times R. And if you're wondering where in the world does this come from, we did this way back in pre-calculus 1, no, 2, whatever one we did circles, I think it's pre-calculus 2. You had a theta. So somehow everybody believes the 2 pi r thing, or remembers it at least, that's circumference but that would be going all the way around the circle. So what we do is we're going to divide it uh, by theta. Is that right? Divide it. That's not what I wanted to do. Theta over 2 pi. There we go. So the reason I'm going to multiply it by theta over 2 pi, how much uh, is a full circle? What theta value would we have for a full circle? 2 pi. So this would be 1 in a full circle. And you think about a half circle, what we have would be half of the circumference. So when we have half a circle, that would be uh, theta would be pi over 2 pi. So we'd get a half multiple out there. So basically, this is the percentage of the circle that you have. If for some reason you go past 2 pi, you're, you know, you've gone a couple of laps at that point. So it'll be a few times bigger than your uh, original. So we're just scaling. Yeah, so the 2 pi's will cancel. Uh, so we get r theta. Now this is not circumference. This is arc length of the theta. So if I use marker right there, this is our arc length. So that's where the uh, radius times the angle comes from that we just used. So that's over here. Radius is r, angle is delta theta, and then the second part, we're just multiplying by delta r. Okay, so this is a k, area of the k uh, piece of, well, technically it's a polar rectangle because you want a certain amount of radius and a certain amount of angle. So that is a polar rectangle. And if you don't believe it, it's a polar rectangle, no problem. Uh, if you think about r and theta as a point, if you write this in separate notation, all r and theta is such that, uh, let's see, well, I can't reuse r. Let's go s and theta such that s is between r and r plus delta theta.
and theta is between, now I need to have some initial theta value, but let me just go So it'll be between theta naught and some initial theta, and then delta theta away from that. Now this is set border notation. I could write this out as our S interval cross with our theta interval. R's come from the first set, data's come from the second set, and it's written just like a polar, or just like a rectangle in Cartesian coordinates. You just have to know you're in polar coordinates. So your first coordinate is a radius, your second coordinate is a theta. So we're about to find some volumes. could write it as the sum of the, or the limit of the sums of the AKs. So lim n approaches infinity, summation k equals zero to n. Now we're usually gonna have uh, some height function, so it'll be f of r comma uh, rk theta k. And <clears throat> what I multiply by now, so this is the height right here, now I'm going to multiply by the area, which we already computed as AK. So it's the height of your function multiplied by the area of the base you're over top of. AK was, I'm going to write it as R first, and then the deltas are going to turn into Ds in a minute, so I'm going to put the delta parts at the end, and I'll put it in D, uh, delta R, delta theta. So I'm going to separate that part off, because that comes, that's not the height, that comes from the area of the base. Now we take a limit, our summation turns into an integral in this case a double integral. So we still get our function f of r comma theta. The r, nothing happens to the regular r. The delta r turns into a dr. The delta theta turns into a d theta. And the region we're going to go over is whatever region r is. So I didn't really describe a region overall, but whatever that region is, is the one you're going to uh, integrate over. Yeah, because you're you're indexing your points by k. Basically, when you write this, you're indexing your points by k values. Okay. So that's why. The no, because there's no there's no k anymore, basically. Okay. All right, so there's our volume, and we'll compute volume very soon. I'm gonna write the area down real fast. Takes two seconds. Why does the area still have an R in it? Yes, yeah, well why does it still have, this is the R that I was thinking, why does it still get that R? Yep, that area basically still had an R in it. It didn't just have dr, d theta. So there's an R inside the actual area. So that's why that R survives. And this is probably the most frequently forgotten part. So I will make sure I highlight, don't forget the R right there. Very commonly forgotten. There may be a problem or two you do. If you skip the R, it might be impossible. It may have been designed to have that R in there. <laughs>